God, thank you so much that you are a God who does beyond all we ask or imagine, that you've loved us in unimaginable ways, you've invited us into your family, and now you're using us in ways that are growing your kingdom supernaturally. God, we're so grateful for that and so grateful for you, and we pray that you would keep on doing a work inside of us that's beyond belief. Even this morning, God, we invite you to be our teacher and to fill us up with your word, help us to understand it better and apply it to our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God has done some things that are beyond belief, and as we head through the midpoint of our Beyond Belief vision campaign, the next four weeks I'm going to be multitasking on my messages with a series called A People Beyond Belief. We'll be doing two things at the same time. One, we're going to be going through the story, the way that we have been going through chapter by chapter, week by week. And the other thing we'll be doing is talking about the vision of our church, a beyond belief vision. And we're going to try and accomplish both agendas still inside of 35 minutes per sermon. So you guys can pray for me uh, that that can take place and pray for yourselves that you can tolerate it. Um, if you're new here and you're not familiar with what we're talking about with the story, the story is a resource that we're going through as a church from preschoolers all the way up to seniors. It takes the narrative parts of the Bible and rearranges it in chronological order, and then it reads like a story. So last week we did Judges, next week we're going to be doing the Kings, and if you're new to Christ Community Church, I just want you to know, jumping in at chapter 10, which is next week's chapter, talking about the Kings is a great time because it's the beginning of a new era in the story, and you can just jump in and track along that way. Now this week we're going to be doing chapter 9, which hopefully you all read last week, and it's the story of Ruth. And uh, the story starts off about Ruth saying, in the period of the judges. Now, if you were here last week, you heard either Pastor Glenn or Pastor Brad uh, talk a little bit about the period of the judges. It was a very dark time. It was perhaps the darkest time in all of the history of Israel. And uh, during that time, though, there was one bright light that was shining out. And it's the story that's captured on these couple of pages called The Book of Ruth, which is a love story. Someone say love story. It's a love story, The Book of Ruth. And that's what we're going to join in right now. Now, the story of Ruth begins in Bethlehem, where a guy named Elimelech and his wife Naomi live. They've got two sons, and a famine has come into play. And on the map here, you can see that they move from Bethlehem to a region called Moab. Now, Moab is modern-day Jordan. It's just on the other side of the Dead Sea. And so they travel down there because there's food there, and there's no food in Bethlehem at the time. Well, while they're living in Moab, uh, they find that there are um, uh, Moabite women for their two sons. So they got their two sons. They get them married off to the two uh, Moabite women. They start making a family, and then tragedy strikes. In fact, chapter 1 of the book of Ruth is all about tragedy and death. And so Naomi experiences the death of the three closest people in her life. She loses Elimelech, she loses both of her sons, and she's left with her two daughters-in-law. And three widows really have no way to support themselves in an ancient world. It's a massive tragedy. So Naomi says to her, her two daughter-in-laws, uh, whose names are Ruth and Orpah, now, incidentally, there's a very famous person in our culture today who on her birth certificate has the name Orpah that was named after this person. Do you guys know who that is? It's, Oprah. yeah, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. She doesn't even need her last name, right? That's how famous she is, Oprah Winfrey. And she was originally named Orpah, but people started pronouncing it Oprah, 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 and it just kind of stuck with her, and that's where we are today. That was just a free sermon bonus for you guys. I hope you... <laughs> I hope you love the sermon bonus that you got there. So anyway, uh, Naomi says to Orpah, Orpah, uh, 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 Orpah and Ruth, you guys really should stay here in Moab, get remarried, find a guy who can take care of your economic needs, start a family, have a ball here. I'm going back to Bethlehem. And Orpah says, okay, I'm staying in Moab, but Ruth does something that's countercultural and radical and noteworthy. Ruth says, no way. I'm staying with you, Naomi, and we're going back to Bethlehem. 
And in an incredible act of love and loyalty, she says these words that became very famous words uh, that Ruth said. This is in the story on page 122. If you're following along, if you're in your Bibles, it's Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. And it says this. Ruth replied, Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord Yahweh deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her to come along with. Wow. Now, I want to point out here the level of faith and loyalty that Ruth is exhibiting. I mean, there must have been something powerful inside of Naomi's character or her God, Yahweh, that made Ruth say, I'm willing to leave all of my people, all of my friends, all of my language to go with you. I mean, think about it. She's moving to a foreign nation where they worship a foreign God and speak a foreign language. She has no economic security. She's moving from being a majority person to being a minority immigrant. And she is taking this huge leap of faith in devotion to Naomi. And this phrase, you know, your people will be my people, your God will be my God, where you go, I'll go, where you stay, I'll stay. It's actually become a famous phrase for people to say in the middle of a wedding ceremony. I don't know if you've heard that at weddings. But whenever I'm planning weddings with young couples, I always get creeped out because I know that this was something that was said to a mother-in-law and not to a husband. So a little bit weird to say it on your wedding day. That was just another bonus for you guys here, another sermon bonus. So for Naomi, or for Ruth, the one word that defines her life throughout this entire story, if you say, what's the one word that uh, that defines Ruth? The word is faith. Somebody say faith. Ruth is defined by faith, and she takes this first off massive act of faith in order to jump in and move back with Naomi in reckless abandon to give her life to join Naomi and really to protect her and honor her as her mother-in-law. So here's a map of the direction that they took. They went from Moab back up to Bethlehem. Uh, Some scholars think that the Dead Sea was drier at that time. They would have cut across. Some think they went around the bottom. But either way, they wound up back in the city that Naomi came from, the city of Bethlehem. And this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, but I think most of you guys already know that Bethlehem becomes a very famous city in the Bible. It becomes famous a few years later because this famous king is born there, King David. That's his hometown. And then about 300 years after that, a prophet by the name of Micah comes on the scene and he says, there's going to be a Messiah that will be born who's going to rescue all of us from our sins and the city that he's going to be born in is Bethlehem. And then 700 years after Micah, his prophecy came true, and Jesus was born in this little po-dunk hick town that may not be known for anything else unless it was for Jesus' life. And that's why every December we sing the song, O Little Town of... O Little Town of Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem also, interestingly, means the house of bread. Beth means house, Lehem is bread, house of bread. And it would be Jesus who would be called the bread of life that would be born in the house of bread. And we would remember him forever and ever by taking a cup of wine and a piece of bread. God had this all thought up in the beginning. And in this part of the story, Ruth and Boaz have their love story over the barley harvest, which was also used to make bread in the house of bread. Does this feel like a setup to you guys? God's been setting us up. Well, Ruth decides that not only would she take the step of faith to go with Naomi, but then she decides she's going to take another step of faith to put herself in a potentially dangerous situation in order to provide for them. And this happens on page 123 at the top. And we see it says, Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. So Ruth is about to go out to the fields and engage in a practice known as gleaning. Now the Old Testament made it possible, not only possible, it was commanded in the Old Testament that anybody who had a grain field 
wasn't supposed to pick up every little grain that got dropped behind them. They keep the main stuff, but if there's little pieces that get dropped, the people who are the poor can come in and pick up all those little pieces so that they have enough to eat. That's called gleaning. And so Ruth says, I'm going to go out and find somebody who's harvesting, and I'm going to glean enough food for us to be able to eat tonight. Now, this was allowed by law, but there would be some people who would be friendly towards this practice and some who would be unfriendly. Some who would protect a a minority immigrant that would be in their fields gleaning, some that would chase her away, some that might even let the guys abuse her. But because Ruth is a person of faith, she says, I'm going to go out and take a step. And she picks a field and it winds up being Boaz's field. Now, if you were ever to travel to Israel, one of the things that you would find if you go to the city of Bethlehem is there's actually a sign in front of a field that says, Boaz's field. Now, I don't think it's really Boaz's field, but it was somewhere close to there, and it's a good way to attract tourists. So they name it Boaz's field, and right across from Boaz's field, no kidding, is a place, I got a picture of this, called Ruth Restaurant. (laughs) Ruth Restaurant. We met a woman inside Ruth Restaurant whose name was Ruth. And she looks pretty good for 3,000 years old, I think. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Ruth takes this dramatic step of faith. She risks rejection, poverty, and abuse. She fully trusts Yahweh and goes for it. And I find that oftentimes God is most active at developing people's faith on this end of the economic spectrum. When you don't have a lot of resources, you're much more likely to cry out to God. When you're in a place that you're in a jam, you need to take more risks. You need to be more dependent on God. And you become more and more aware of the way that God provides for you day by day. I know that this was true for Kelly and I when we very first got married. We had very little money. We had barely enough to put spaghetti on the table every single night. And when we prayed, give us this day our daily bread, it was like a literal prayer. God, give us today enough food for us to eat. Further, I rode my bike everywhere in town because we only had one car and I wanted to save on gas. And I wore mismatched clothes every single day. That had nothing to do with being poor. I was just bad at matching clothes. (laughs) But we were first married. Kelly was a substitute teacher, and I was a full-time student, and I worked in the home economics library. I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that now, but it really is true. There was a day when my job was home economics librarian, (laughs) filing things about fabrics all day long. (laughs) Well, we got to our first month of being married, and to be honest, we got our first paychecks, and it wasn't enough to pay the bills for the month. It was only partway through the month, and we had to make a very strategic decision. And that is, are we going to trust God and have faith to say, we're going to give our 10% to the work of God, even though we don't know if we're going to be able to pay the bills at the end of the month? And we made the decision, yes, we're going to, and we gave that money trusting that God would give us enough substitute teaching jobs and enough hours in the home economics library that at the end of the month we'd actually be able to pay the rent. And now that was an incredible time of growing faith for Kelly and me. In fact, we found during that entire era that there was never one time that we weren't able to pay the rent or have food on the table or a little gas in the gas tank. Because God provided for us, and what he was doing was he was increasing our faith so that later on in life, when we have more resources, we're able to continue to act in the faith that he molded in us when we were on that end of the economic spectrum. God continues to do that work in our life when we have more and more resources. Now, Boaz is the hero who comes into the story at this point. He's the other hero of the story. And the story now shifts to Boaz. Now, Boaz's key characteristic is not faith. Boaz has his own key characteristic. His characteristic is generosity. Someone say generosity. And God uses the faith of Ruth and the generosity of Boaz to change the world. Listen to how Boaz responds in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. This is also found on page 123. It says this. Boaz, in his first encounter with Ruth, says, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. 
Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. I mean, generosity from the very first time that he meets her. Hey, you stay in my field. It'll be safe here. We're going to take care of you. Take as much as, uh, as you can gather yourself. And as a bonus, you know, whenever you get thirsty, feel free. we got some Gatorade jugs over in the corner. Grab everything you need. Just don't throw it on the coach when the game is done. But I also want to point out that there's a racial element that's going on in this story. Because Ruth is the minority immigrant in the story. She looks different than the other girls. She talks different than the other girls. And she winds up being stunned that Boaz would be kind to a foreigner like her. And so Boaz explains in verses 11 and 12 at the bottom of 123. Boaz says, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. And then the last line, may you be richly rewarded by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have taken refuge. Boaz notices that uh, Ruth is a woman of outstanding character, of excellent character. Now, it's possible she may have also been a cute little Moabitess, but that's not what the story says. The story says that I've noticed your loyalty to your mother-in-law and your faithfulness to God, and may God himself pay you back for your love and your faithfulness. And he saw himself as the agent of God who was called by God to be the provision of God for this young woman. Boaz is impressed with what kind of a woman that she is. Now, Boaz, interestingly, is at the other end of the economic spectrum that Ruth is on. Boaz is a guy who owns a field, and he's got servants, and he's got enough food on the table, and we find out later that he's got grain in the threshing floor, which is like having money in the bank. Boaz is at the far end of the positive end of the economic spectrum, but he sees himself not as the owner of everything, but as the manager, the distributor of everything. He realizes that his job is not to own stuff and spend it according to his needs, but instead that everything that he has is a provision of God, and it's his job to manage and distribute all of those resources according to God's priorities. He's learned that he's not an owner, he is a steward, and the key principle of stewardship is it's all God's anyway. Someone say, it's all God's anyway. It's all God's anyway. So you realize that I don't own everything, it's my job to be generous, and Boaz takes his generosity to a whole new level. Listen to this secret conversation he has with his shift manager on uh, page 124. He says to him, let her gather among the sheaves, and don't reprimand her. So the sheaves are the places that it's already been collected. Just let her collect from the places it's already been collected. Even pull out some stalks for her and... Take them out of the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. He's saying, I don't want to just give the leftovers to this girl. I want to give out of my regular, normal income. He's taking his generosity to the next level. And that's where many of us are as well, where we say, you know what? I do give to God, but I kind of just give tips. I give the leftovers here and there. Boaz models generosity at a new level, where he says, take out of what you have, out of your income, and give that. Now, we're in an interesting place right now. We're in a Beyond Belief Refresh Month. And this is a really cool time for us as a church. As you saw in the video, we started a year ago this month. And we've been making good on the commitments people have made. We're watching God do more than we ever asked or imagined here at Old Mill, in the broader city of Omaha, in places like Peru and Tunisia and Mali, and nations that we can't even say their names, lest the people that we've sent there be endangered. And we believe that God has in mind more than we ever asked or imagined. I mean, just because we exceeded our secondary goal of $22 million doesn't mean that it's time to sit back and coast. Just like Boaz, we have been blessed to be a blessing, and it's our job to manage the resources that God has given us. So we're now kind of at that halftime moment for Beyond Belief. And because of God's grace, we're winning. 
More people in the kingdom, more churches, more missionaries, more healing, better facilities that are prepared for another generation of ministry. And when you're winning at halftime, it is not time to give up. <laughs> I just want you to know, I wrote that line on Wednesday, not last <laughs> night. If you're winning at halftime, it's time to double down and go for it. To say, let's make the second half better than the first. Now, when we embarked on this journey a year ago, I told you it's a journey of discipleship. It's not primarily about the money. It's about accelerating our faith, our surrender, and our generosity. And I believe that God's doing that deep in our lives. I really do. But these goals are not met. The goals of surrender and faith and generosity won't be met if we say, okay, we had an act of faith a year ago, and that's good enough. It's time for us to stop. If we say that was just good enough and we're not going to re-examine ourselves, then that says it really was all about the money and not about our hearts. Friends, I want to ask you to stay on your spiritual edge, to keep asking the question, God, do you have something new for me today? Am I acting on faith or I'm just coasting comfortably? Am I living a life that's beyond belief? Now, if you're new here since last November, and there's hundreds of people who are, you didn't miss your opportunity to be a part of this vision beyond belief. The giving in the second year is just as important as the giving that was in the first year. And I know that there are some who didn't commit last year. I mean, maybe for you it just wasn't the right time. Maybe you were waiting to see if others would go on board because you didn't want to be the first to act in faith. Maybe you were waiting to see if you could actually trust the leaders to do what we would say, to actually renovate the worship center, to actually send out missionaries, to actually raise our Great Commission Fund giving by 25%. And now that we are doing these things, you have increased faith and trust that you can take a faith risk and trust God to make a new commitment. So I'm challenging you to be in prayer, to consider what God is doing in your heart. Whether you made a commitment last year or not, to ask, am I living a life beyond belief? Now, I know that talking of generosity can be uncomfortable. And you know what I say to that? Good. Let's be uncomfortable together. Because God oftentimes does his deepest works in our discomfort. It's in our discomfort that faith catches fire. And you may be more like Ruth at one end of the economic spectrum, maybe even at the end of your rope. You may be like Boaz and have a stable job and be more well-resourced. But God takes us through acts of faith in order to develop us when we're young and uh, when we have less so that we can be extra generous when God provides for us more. So my challenge to everyone, to both groups, is to pray, God, show me what you're doing in my heart, in my faith, in my family, on my journey. Now, as you leave, you're going to be handed a card that explains the vision and explains our midpoint commitment. You'll see yourself in one of three options on that card, I believe. Option number one is to say, I'm going to make a first-time commitment to 12 months. You're somebody who's new or didn't commit last year, and you're ready to jump on board and say, let me be a part of this cool thing. Even if it's for 12 months, I want in. And if that's the case, I say, awesome, welcome to the team. Option number two is to finish strong. So some of you are right on track. You made a commitment last year. It really did stretch your faith. You're living by faith. You prayed. God gave you a certain amount. You're given that amount, and it is keeping your faith hot. And if that's the case, then your goal is just finish strong. Do what God told you to do. But many of us have made a commitment in the last year, and it may not have been easy. I know for Kelly and me, it stretched us. It was our largest financial commitment to anything in our lifetime. Maybe God is growing your faith or your resources. Maybe he surprised you this year by giving you a job or a promotion or your stock portfolio's on the rise or you got some kind of a windfall. And you're saying, God, what do you want me to do with this that you've provided me? Maybe your commitment last year felt like a stretch, but this year it's become comfortable or routine. The challenging question for all of us is, am I still living a life beyond belief? 
And even though we made our secondary goal of 22 million, we have more work to do on our goal, our main goal of 100% engagement. And this year I'm praying for 100% engagement. I'm dreaming that every person who calls Christ Community Church, their church home, would pray and invite God's spirit to make a generosity commitment by the leading and the grace that he has given you. And if he does, I think God might unleash a tsunami of generosity that winds up leaving us not with $22 million of kingdom investment, but $24 million. And this would empower the church to do more of what we're called to do, more missions to the least reached people in the planet, more churches planted, more of the poor cared for, more residents raised up, more capital improvements to our building and infrastructure, because God is on the move, and we are just keeping up with him. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, I think God's going to do more than we ask or imagine in this, but I want to take us back into our text. I want us to go back to Mr. Generosity here, Boaz. Boaz takes his generosity one more level up later on in the text. Because at the end of the idea, he exceeds just giving out of his income, and instead he gives out of his stored resources, his bank account essentially on the threshing floor, when he gives six measures of barley to Ruth at the end of the story. So you say, well, why would he do that? Why why would he give that to Ruth at that time? Well, the way the story unfolded is that Naomi had coached Ruth. She said, hey, Ruth, go ahead and take your nicest clothes, put them on, put a little bit of perfume on, and go and visit Boaz where he's hanging out at the threshing floor. And she goes, she hangs out with Boaz at the threshing floor, and the symbol of her new clothes and her perfume was, I'm no longer a grieving widow, But now I'm available, and the fact that I'm perfumed and standing in front of you means that I'm available to you, Boaz. And Boaz catches the hint. And he kind of likes the hint. Because Boaz is like a middle-aged dude, and uh, Ruth is young. And he's like, you didn't go after all the young men. You came after me. And the plot thickens here because Boaz is not just a middle-aged creeper. (laughs) He's what's known in the Bible as a guardian redeemer. And in the world of Israel, this is what goes on. When a man dies, there are certain people that are assigned to take his land, to buy his land back and bring it into their family. That way it stays in the same family, in the same tribe, and doesn't get taken over by foreigners. But he's also obligated to take on the man's widow, and if there's no kids, to continue the family line through that widow so that that guy and his wife will have an inheritance and children that will be able to take up that inheritance. So Boaz is a guardian redeemer for Ruth because of his relationship to them. But he's not the number one guardian redeemer. He's the number two guardian redeemer. And so when he finds out that Ruth is interested, he does a fascinating thing that unfolds in chapter 4. He goes to the front gate of the city. He gathers together 10 of the elders, and he finds the guy who's the number one guardian redeemer. And in front of the 10 elders says, hey, you're number one guardian redeemer. Do you want to buy back Elimelech's property? And the guy says, ah, property, good. Yes, I will buy that back. And he says, but if you do, you also inherit Ruth the Moabitess, and a fresh mother-in-law. <laughs> so the guy thinks twice about it, says, that's going to mess with my inheritance. I don't know about the whole Moabitess thing or the mother-in-law thing. So I'm going to keep my hands off. And at that point, in front of the city gate, Boaz says, I'll take it then. Because I'm the number two guardian redeemer. And he takes off his sandal as a sign of signing contract. I don't know why they did that, but that's what they did in ancient days. I'm going to take off my sandal to sign the contract. And then Ruth... And Naomi and the land was his. And it's a win-win-win. Because now Naomi has economic security. Boaz has a young wife. And Ruth has a husband who's going to love her and take care of her for the rest of his life. It's this cool thing that happens where in the beginning of the book, it starts with tragedy and death. And Ruth and Boaz get together, get married, get busy, and pretty soon there's a baby that comes along. And the way that the story ends is with triumph and a birth. Tragedy and death in the beginning, triumph and a birth at the end. God's showing the way that 
faith and generosity can change the fortunes of these two people and can, in fact, change the world. And here's how. Because that little baby that came on the scene, his name was Obed, and he wasn't a regular old baby. He had a son by the name of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of King David in Bethlehem. And the story of Israel unfolds from there. And those of you who were here two weeks ago remember that David is not just a great king, but he's also an ancestor of Jesus himself. So God saw fit to put this Moabitess immigrant woman not only into the bloodline of David, but into the bloodline of Jesus himself. Isn't that just like God to do that? You see, this happens with God a lot. In fact, in the ancient world, in the Middle East, it was very unusual, it's still very unusual, for a woman ever to be recorded in the ancestry of anybody. But in Jesus' genealogy, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, there are two highlighted women in that genealogy. It's usually all men, but in this case, you have Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute, and Ruth, the Moabitess immigrant. And God says, these are people I want in my family. These are people I love and want to put in my family. And I want you to know, if you feel like a Moabitess immigrant today, if you feel unnoticed or unloved, there is a God in the universe who knows your name and loves you and has incredible plans for you. In fact, in fact, Jesus wants to take this same pattern of faith and generosity and continue to change the world. You might have noticed that in this book, there was very little signs of God's intervention. Did you notice in Ruth, there's no miracles, there's no divine intervention. There's just a couple of people acting in faith and generosity in the middle of the book of Judges. And I think God did that on purpose. Because most of our lives are not filled with miracles and divine intervention. Most of our lives are filled with faith and generosity. And God's pointing out, I can change the world through that. Oh yeah, and there's one more thing that you have to notice from this. And that is that Jesus is foreshadowed in the book of Ruth. I don't know if you know this, but Boaz is a foreshadowing of who Jesus is as the guardian redeemer. And that Jesus himself is actually the ultimate guardian redeemer who says, I will enter into your world, even if you're a Moabitess immigrant, and I will buy you back and invite you into my family. Boaz is somebody who extended generosity upon generosity upon generosity. Jesus is the ultimate example of somebody who extended generosity upon generosity upon generosity. I mean, he made the universe in a way that's very generous. The number of stars, the number of species speaks of Jesus' generosity. The fact that he created billions of human beings speaks of his generosity. And the fact that he would stop at nothing to buy us back, (laughs) pay even his own blood for you and for me, so that we could be in his family, it speaks of his generosity to us. He is our kinsman redeemer who invites us to be in his family and he says, I'll change your life, I'll change your future, I'll change your eternity if you'll just join in with me. And guys, I wanna make that invitation real for you here today. Would you stand uh, all over in this room? And I'm gonna be praying a prayer in a minute and it's just a prayer towards the God of generosity. And believe it or not, our response to the groom of generosity is to be a person of faith. That's what God invites us into. He says, you want to get your hands on the generosity of my one and only son who offers forgiveness and meaning and hope and purpose? Well, place your faith in him. And today I want to give you that chance. Maybe God's been at work in your life in some powerful ways. Maybe you've been exploring this Christian thing. Maybe you've seen his fingers come into your life and he's shaping things new inside of you and you go, I think I see God all over the place. I just don't know what my next step is. Well, let me tell you, your next step is to take a step of faith towards the most generous God who's ever been out there and offers you a deal. He says, you bring your sins, you bring your faith, and I will give you hope and life and meaning and purpose, forgiveness, and eternity in response. It's the best deal ever. And so if you want to buy into that deal, all you have to do is place your faith in Jesus, and it all starts by telling him. We're going to do this in a prayer today, so I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. 
And if today's the day that you want to place your faith in Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance to say yes to him. What I'll do is I'll pray a prayer of faith, and you can just agree in your mind and say, yes, Lord, that's me. Yes, Lord, that's me. If this is really, really true of you. So let's pray together. God, we trust in you as the ultimate God of generosity. Thank you that you were generous when you made us. Thank you that you were generous in coming to be one of us. And thank you that you were generous in dying on our behalf so that you will extend life to us. Today, God, I just want to say to you that I have faith in what you've done for me. I have faith in you as a person. I have faith in your death on the cross substituting for my sins. And I have faith in your resurrection from the dead that brings me new life. God, we are grateful for your presence in our life and for your offer of eternal life. Make that real for me right now as I declare my faith and trust in you. And I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, our Healer, our Sanctifier, and our coming King. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, if you said yes to Jesus in that prayer right now, it is a life-changing, eternity-altering moment for you. Let's welcome all of our friends who have said yes to Jesus today. We're grateful to you, grateful to God for you. You are welcome in the family. And if that's the case for you, I want to encourage you to fill out one of these next step cards. Tell us about your decision today, and you can either bring it to the Next Steps booth or put it in the boxes uh, as you leave today, and we'll have somebody get a hold of you later this week because we're in the business of helping people grow in their faith from the time that they start on. Now, may the God of generosity enable you to live a life of faith in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Have an awesome week.